The next item of business is portfolio questions. And the first portfolio is justice and the law officers. Uh, if any member wishes to ask a supplementary question, just press the request to speak button in the usual way and call question number one, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what steps prisons are taking to reduce the risk of coronavirus COVID-19 spreading amongst prisoners and staff. I'm sorry, you, sir. The safety and well-being of those living and working in our prisons is a priority for both this government and indeed the Scottish Prison Service. The SPS's National Coronavirus Response Group has implemented its national pandemic plan, uh, which includes governors in charge overseeing the del delivery of those local plans uh, tailored to the needs of their individual establishments. Uh, these groups are meeting on a daily basis. Like other public sector bodies, the SPS has robust phased contingency plans in place which reflect escalation demands. At this time, the SPS is following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, which means that anyone in custody displaying symptoms will self-isolate. Similarly, prison staff displaying symptoms have been advised to follow the same advice and self-isolate. The SPS is in regular communication with those in custody to provide guidance on how to prevent the spread of infection and update them on how the virus may impact their daily routine. This includes letters to every prisoner across the estate, as well as video messaging via in-cell televisions. The SPS has established clinically led protocols for the testing, management and care of those who may contract or be suspected of contracting COVID-19 and has secured a sufficient level of personal protection equipment to support these protocols, uh, which are designed to minimise the risk of contamination spread. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how visitors to prisons like Stockton and my constituency should proceed as the COVID-19 enters this new phase of self-isolation? Hamza, you sir. I think it's a hugely important point raised by Gordon uh, MacDonald. We saw in the unfortunate case in Italy where um, there was prison riots and a number of people lost their lives, that actually that wasn't precipitated by an infection uh, or a case of, of, of coronavirus in the prison uh, was precipitated by tensions rising in the prison because things like visiting uh, was uh, well, not limited, was completely uh, stopped altogether and, and prisoners uh, in their cells for practically 24 hours a day. We're keen, of course, not to do that. So we will follow uh, the chief medical officer's advice. Uh, we will continue to allow visits, but of course they must follow guidelines. So therefore visitors will be asked uh, of course, not to attend uh, visits uh, if they are displaying symptoms. They should be following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer, which is to self-isolate. Um, there are posters at the entrance of all establishments advising visitors of, of, that, of that, and information is also provided by the external website and social media accounts. So the situation, as the member knows, is fast moving, very fluid, uh, and of course, we'll continue to see uh, and explore what other ways family contact can be maintained uh, via digital means as well. I have three supplementaries for this. I wish to take them all, but please be quick in the supplementary questions and answers. Please, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Gordon MacDonald identifies, the Prison Service and Police Scotland are both organisations that, for the safety of the Scottish public, must continue to interact with many different people and communities. Given the obvious current health risk to both groups, could the Cabinet Secretary outline any contingency plans he has in place to help with personnel shortages? For example, has he considered bringing in retired officers or perhaps using tra trainees, if that were safe? Hamza Yusuf. I thank Liam Kerr for a very important question. I spoke to the Chief Constable uh, just about uh, over an hour and a half ago, and um, he obviously has operational independence for this matter in relation to the police. But fair to say he and the senior management team are looking at exactly the kind of things that Liam Kerr suggests. Not only those who have retired, um, but actually looking at what more can be done with special constables, which I know Liam Kerr has had an interest in um, before. So uh, we're looking at a range, or Police Scotland, I should say, are looking at a range of measures. Uh, and I know SPS are also looking at contingency plans uh, as, as well in relation to those that have recently left the organisation uh, and, and, and clearly still have uh, a number of skills that they can offer uh, the organisation. I'm, I'm happy to keep the member updated as, as those plans develop. James Kelly. Thank you. Given the confined conditions that prison officers and prisoners operate within the prison estate, there is clearly a, a risk, a high risk, uh, of the spread of uh, COVID-19. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if any 
prisoner or prison officer uh, presents with any, any medical condition, including COVID-19, can he guarantee that they will get immediate, appropriate medical follow-up? I'm sorry, you said? Uh, yes, that is certainly uh, what the pandemic plan, which has been put in place in relation to, to COVID-19, will do. Of course, it is essential that everybody, be they in prison or indeed out with the prison uh, uh, establishments, follows the Chief Medical Officer's guidelines. What will help in, in relation to, to stopping that spread? Well, first and foremost, ensuring that our prison staff who do an excellent job, I think we'd all recognise that, have the appropriate PPE uh, equipment. Uh, and pr the prison service, as, as things stand, have around about a couple of months supply of that. I'm speaking to them about can they, can they up those stocks and, and we can uh, assist with that. But clearly following the Chief Medical Officer's advice, um, in self-isolation, uh, if you present the symptoms, is going to be really, really key. So there will be people, there are people, I should say, in the prison service that are self-isolating. Um, unfortunately, more, uh, I suspect, will, will, will end up having to self-isolate. Um, but we will continue to follow the protocols that are in place. Willie Rennie. I'm particularly concerned about um, prisoners who are either elderly or in the pre-existing conditions in terms of long-term conditions, how they can socially distance in the close confines of a prison when there isn't an awful lot of spare capacity. So how is the minister going to manage that? I'm sorry, you, sir. Well, that is very much part of the conversations that are taking place. And we are going to have to think about um, being quite radical in terms uh, of, of, of our solutions. But in some relation, in some respects, um, there is the ability to self-isolate or keep people contained, uh, perhaps better within uh, the prison service than perhaps um, out with. Uh, but I don't, uh, for a second, take away from the challenges that the prison service uh, has. I think Willie Rennie raises a really important point. We have uh, an older population within the prison service. Um, largely, uh, that, 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 that population is growing uh, year on year. And therefore, we're also thinking about uh, how we um, ensure that their uh, health needs uh, are met. So this is all part of that pandemic plan. Uh, we do have challenges within the prison estate in relation to the numbers that are there, uh, but so far uh, we are managing that, but clearly uh, we're keeping an eye on uh, what more can and should be done in that regard. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government for an update on firefighter pay negotiations. Ash Denham. The Scottish Government is not a party in the negotiations on firefighter pay and this is a matter between the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service as the employer and the Fire Brigades Union. Following three years of discussion and negotiation in October 2019, SFRS made a final 17% pay offer for the period between July 2019 and July 2022 in recognition of an expanded firefighter role. The FBU executive recommended rejection of this offer and the FBU members voted to reject the offer on the 28th of February. Further negotiation on these issues is a matter for SFRS and the FBU and SFRS has indicated that following the FBU rejection of its final offer uh, for a specific deal for Scottish firefighters negotiations will now revert back to mechanisms of the UK-wide National Joint Council. Jamie Green. All right, can I thank the Minister for that uh, helpful update and the Government's position on those proceedings. And I hope the Parliament will permit me some licence for my supplementary to make it more suitable to topical developments. Um, can I ask two specific questions? What contingency plans are currently in place should we see significant numbers of firefighters off work due to isolation in their household? And does the Minister anticipate our fire service in Scotland to have to take on any additional duties or responsibilities as demand on all of our emergency services, no doubt, will increase in the coming months? Ash Denham. I thank the member for that question. Uh, I've obviously been in uh, contact um, over the last week um, and ongoing basis with SFRS um, about their planning. Um, they've obviously taken a number of measures already to, to start to um, get ready for what we uh, may be facing. They've reviewed all their planning and uh, the Cabinet Secretary and I um, tomorrow have a meeting with all our justice partners on, uh, on the emergency services side to go into detail on more of these sort of emerging issues. I'll be happy to obviously come back and keep the, um, keep the members updated on that. 
but clearly um, part of the planning assumptions would be a planning for the fact that staff numbers um, on the frontline services will be reduced and that is built into the planning assumptions. Um, in terms of the fire service um, taking on additional duties, um, I would um, say that that is certainly something that is um, under consideration. And I'll be happy to keep the chamber updated um, as we go forward on this. Quick supplementary, please, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister agree that now would be a good time and show goodwill for the UK Government to restore the £50 million in VAT that it took from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service between 2013 and 2017? Ash Denham. I would. <coughs> Question number three, Joanne Lamont. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support the Don't Tolerate Hate campaign. I'm sorry, Yusuf. Well, simply put, any form of hate or prejudice is totally unacceptable. It will not be tolerated. Uh, hate crime has a hugely damaging effect on victims, their families and the communities. No one should have to tolerate being attacked because they have a disability or an impairment. Uh, and I very much commend uh, Sam, Ivan, Alison and Sean, who have shared their experiences as part of Police Scotland's Don't Tolerate Hate campaign. Although the number of disability hate crime incidents and charges reported are low, uh, we're not complacent and we recognise very much that disability hate crime uh, is uh, underreported. The Scottish Government welcomes this campaign and will continue to support Police Scotland to encourage victims and witnesses to report disability hate crime. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, he has reflected on it already, will agree that this Police Scotland campaign, Don't Tolerate Hate, is an important one. And no one could be unmoved by the disturbing testimonies from disabled people at the launch of the campaign about the reality of their experience of abuse. Given that one in five people in Scotland is registered as having a disability, but this category of crime accounts for only 4% of reports to Police Scotland, would the Cabinet Secretary consider how barriers to disabled people reporting their experience of abuse can be removed? And how will it make it clear that such abuse is a crime and will not be tolerated and perhaps recognise that this is a particularly important, uh, a particularly serious issue in these heightened times. I'm saying you, sir. Well, I agree with everything Joanne uh, Lamont has just said. In order to give her some reassurances, she may be aware that we'll shortly be introducing uh, to this parliament hate crime legislation. That's the, that's the intention, of course. Uh, that may well be delayed uh, because of uh, pressing matters. But we do have uh, that hate crime legislation uh, coming forward uh, and there will be a very strong emphasis uh, in relation to the hate uh, that people with a disability uh, face. So that will give some legislative, uh, I, I hope, uh, reassurance uh, to, to, to the member. Uh, in terms of um, the underreporting, we obviously have third party reporting centres, uh, as Joanne Lamont will absolutely be aware. But I will take this forward with the Chief Constable in our regular conversations that we have. He, uh, I know, also recognises, as I do, because we've had a conversation about this previously, that underreporting does take place. So any of those barriers that exist, uh, we should work with people with disabilities to understand them uh, and absolutely work collectively to remove them. But I accept her central point uh, that that is underreported. Question number four has been withdrawn. Question number five, Alex Cole Hamilton. Oh. <laughs> I'm totally, I don't entirely sure what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to read it out for you, Mr. Cole yeah, Hamilton? Um, <laughs> Alex Biden. Cole Hamilton. Do you ask the Scottish Government? Uh, <laughs> I'll wait for the supplementary. Well, you will this one. Do you ask it, I'm very grateful you're presiding officer. I'm delighted to be able to offer the Chamber some levity this afternoon. Do you ask the Scottish Government what discussions uh, the Justice Secretary has had with ministerial colleagues regarding how many of the 800 additional mental health workers committed to in its mental health strategy will be deployed within police and prison services in Edinburgh? A, 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 a simply brilliantly thought out uh, question, uh, I must say. Uh, the first time I've ever seen Alex Cole Hamilton speechless uh, in, in, in the chamber. Let's hope it's not the last. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the serious point, of course, that Alex Cole Hamilton makes is an important one. Action 15 within the mental health strategy outlines our commitment to funding 800 additional mental health workers in key settings, including a and uh, all GP practices, uh, and crucially, for the purposes of his, his question, every police station custody suite and to our prisons, uh, ensuring that local provision and support is at the heart uh, mm. of those plans. Uh, the use of Action 15 funding in prisons was discussed at a ministerial meeting chaired by the Deputy First Minister on the 4th of December and the Scottish Government's response to the expert review on mental health supporting uh, support for young people entering and in custody. Um, work on Action 15 complements wider efforts to improve mental health outcomes 
for those in the justice system, including the work of the National Prison Care Network and Refreshed Police Care Network. I hope I've given Alice Hamilton enough time to think of the supplementary. And, and I hope it'll be a short supplementary, Mr. It, it will be, and I'm, I'm grateful. I do apologise. Um, in the context of the situation in which we find ourselves, um, mental health is going to be so important for particularly those people who find themselves in so social isolation, sometimes for many, many weeks. In a lot of ways, we are all going to have to become mental health care providers to our loved ones and our friends and our family. And I voice again the support of my party to the government for, for every effort they put behind mental health, but would ask that he consider that and, and ask what steps he takes to ensure that all the original work we were doing about mental health doesn't fall by the wayside in the teeth of this crisis. Ingenious. Short answer would be appreciated, Hamza Yusuf. <laughs> well, just to give him some reassurance, I mean, for those that are in our care, uh, be they in prisons or indeed the police custody suites, we take their mental health extremely seriously. We've already started recruitment uh, as part of Action 15 uh, 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 of the mental health uh, additional funding into our prisons, into our police custody suites, and I take the point uh, that the member makes. Question number six, Miles Briggs. To ask the Scottish Government what progress the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is making with, with efforts to reduce waiting times for toxicology results. James Wolfe. Um, thank you. The steps already taken uh, or being taken by the service to address waiting times include, firstly, an additional £300,000 investment to Glasgow University, which provides most of the toxicology services in Scotland under contract with the service. That investment specifically for clearing overdue toxicology reports, recruiting additional staff and buying new equipment. Secondly, agreeing an improvement plan with the university to facilitate the prioritisation of cases. Thirdly, securing agreement on simplified procedures for reporting certain categories of case. And fourthly, temporarily arranging to outsource a discrete block of cases in order to free up capacity. And as a result of the measures already taken, we have seen a significant improvement in the weekly output of the university since the end of last year. Miles Briggs. I thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. Does the government accept that the significant delay to receiving post-mortem results has really caused a huge amount of distress to too many families across Scotland? Um, given the events surrounding COVID-19, can the Lord Advocate update Parliament on any potential impact this will now have, especially given the fact the Crown Office does re rely on contracts with external labs and experts? And also, secondly, um, when does the Scottish Government now expect that the drug death figures will be published? James Wolfe. Um, can I start by absolutely acknowledging the impact which the delays in receipt of a final cause of death can have for bereaved families? I, um, I, I, I absolutely understand and appreciate that. I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work being undertaken by the toxicology staff and indeed the staff of the service in, 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 in addressing the uh, uh, backlog of, of, of cases. Um, specifically in respect of the impact of uh, COVID-19, um, uh, that's going to have an impact on all aspects of the public service. I think it would be foolish for me to seek to predict what that impact uh, will be. Um, as I mentioned in my first answer, considerable work has been done and is being done, which is uh, delivering significant improvement in relation to the uh, throughput of toxicology cases. Um, that will continue, but of course will continue subject to any adverse impact as, as a result of, uh, of um, uh, COVID-19 on staffing levels. I'm afraid I can't be more reassuring at this time. All of us are having to make contingency plans into, in relation to a variety of aspects of the public service. All I can say is that um, the service, the kind of property fiscal service, will, will remain committed uh, to the improvement work in this area, as in all other areas, uh, and in uh, uh, acting appropriately and responsibly in the context of the public health uh, demands that are being placed on us all. Uh, an extremely quick supplementary, please, to Monica Lennon. I'll try, because it's a very emotive subject, and my heart goes out to all those mums who are going to have to face Mother's Day still not knowing why their 
their, their loved ones died. But can I ask about some of the, the cold hard numbers behind this? Because referring to the waiting times and backlog isn't enough. We need some transparent information. So can I ask what are the current waiting times? Because families tell me that staff are advising them it's between eight and 12 months. And that backlog, how big is it? I think I had figures from the Lord Advocate in November, which covered February to November last year. It was almost 2,000 cases. From February to now, how many cases have waited more than, than 12 weeks? James Wolfe. Yes, I'm grateful to Monica Lennon and grateful to her for her interest in this particular subject. Um, uh, the, um, recently, the waiting times, as I'm uh, advised, has been around uh, eight months. Um, that's in a context where prior to the difficulties that have been experienced, uh, toxicology reports were being made available within between six and eight weeks, depending on the circumstances, and post-mortem reports being available uh, generally within uh, 12 weeks. Um, the current number of cases, uh, as at the 13th of March, the total number of cases reported for toxicology awaiting report uh, is uh, 1,692. I'm advised that um, the university uh, anticipates that, at the, that with the various measures that have been taken, uh, all 2019 cases are expected to be reported by the end of May this year. Uh, that is, of course, subject, I regret, to any issues that arise as a result of the COVID-19 um, uh, 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 context uh, on that. That concludes questions to Justice and the Law Officers. Apologies to Anna Sarwar for not reaching his question. And we'll move on now as quickly as possible, please, to questions on Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. Uh, we are very pushed for time, so brevity would be appreciated. Question number one, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to promote fair trade. Jenny Gores. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 24th of February 2020, the Scottish Government published its first ever review of fair trade in Scotland with a view to increasing fair trade sales. As a fair trade nation, we are committed to ensuring that farmers and producers in the developing world are paid a fair price for their goods. That is why we are continuing our long-standing relationship with the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, which we core fund to promote fair trade across Scotland. I was delighted to meet with the Chair and the Chief Executive of the Forum at the end of last month during Fair Trade Fortnight to discuss the direction of their future work. The Scottish Government will continue to work with the Forum to consider how best to take forward the recommendations highlighted in the review in the coming months and years. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, the and can, can I thank the Minister for, for that response? Now, the review she mentioned, called What Future for Fair Trade in Scotland, um, argued that Scotland must promote fair trade as part of the solution to the climate crisis. So, can I ask, how does the Scottish Government plan on working with the UK Government to promote fair trade at COP26 in Glasgow? Jenny Gulruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think that's a, a fair question from Graham Simpson. As he has outlined, the, the UK will host the 26th UN Climate Change Conference, uh, also known as COP26, in Glasgow in November this year. And fair trade at COP26 was an issue which was highlighted in my recent meeting with the Scottish Fair Trade Forum. As part of our planning, uh, of our planning at the moment for COP26, the, the Government will consider how fair trade can be factored into those events. And I'm happy to work with UK Government counterparts to ensure that COP26 is used as a platform to promote and to celebrate fair trade. Question number two has been withdrawn. Question number three, Claudia Beam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will pro pro provide an update on the inter-ministerial group on policy coherence for sustainable development that it announced at Scotland's International Development Alliance, AGM, in September 2019. Jenny Goldruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since the announcement of the establishment of the Ministerial Working Group on Policy Coherence for Sustainable Development, key pieces of work have been taken forward uh, by the Scottish Government. Just last week, along with the Cabinet Secretary, I met with James Mackey from the European Centre for Development in Maastricht, um, a leading European think tank with experience of working with other European countries on implementing PCSD, and following which a cross-section of Scottish Government policy officials undertook a workshop uh, delivered by the European Centre for Development Experts. 
The first meeting of the PCSD Working Group is currently scheduled for May, um, and as Minister for Europe and International Development, I look forward to leading this group. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the Minister for that um, clear answer. With the eyes of the world on Scotland ahead of the COP in Glasgow no in November, um, virus permitting, does the Minister agree that all Ministers uh, need to get behind this working group to ensure policy coherence across all areas of government if there really is um, to do no harm as it committed to in signing the Sustainable Development Goals? Jenny Gorris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would absolutely ag agree with Claudia Beamish on that point. Uh, policy coherence cuts across all portfolio areas, as she has outlined. And she'll also know that back in 2016, we published our Beyond Aid agenda, uh, which committed to ensure that different Scottish Government policies worked together um, to ensure our development policy worked together in synergy, as it were, to eliminate policy incoherence um, and also to identify other Scottish Government policies which can contribute uh, positively to development outcomes. And as part of that, uh, in particular, that commitment to do no harm, as Claudia B. mentioned, is the focus of our policy coherence for sustainable development. To better align our policies across the Government uh, to the UN Global Sustainable Development Goals, it does require coordination across portfolio areas, as Claudia B. has outlined. Question number four has been withdrawn. Question number five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what actions is taking in response to the independent review on the Humanitarian Emergency Fund. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2019, the Scottish Government commissioned an independent review of its £1 million per annum Humanitarian Emergency Fund. We published the review report in full on the 10th of February this year. The independent review highlighted a number of uh, successes for the fund. However, the reviewers also identified uh, areas for potential improvement. The Scottish Government thereafter discussed with stakeholders a range of options for improving the fund. These changes are now being taken forward and will be fully implemented in time for the financial year 2020-21. Currently, we are preparing to appoint new members to the Humanitarian Emergency Fund panel with announcements to be made at the end of the month. Alexander Stewart will appreciate that as a new minister, I'm keen <coughs> that we get this right. Um, as such, I've requested to meet with the outgoing panel members as soon as that is possible in the current circumstances. I'm also pleased to highlight that a million pounds has been protected in the Scottish Government's 2020-21 budget for the fund, demonstrating our ongoing commitment to help the world's most vulnerable. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive response. There are three secondary aims within the fund, building public awareness and raising additional funding, promoting the Scottish Government as a responsible global citizen and enhancing transparency of emergency funding. The review highlighted concerns for all three areas. Therefore, what measures are in place to track the progress of each aim and what immediate action will the Government take in light of that review? Jenny Gorris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Humanitarian Emergency Fund was designed from scratch, so it is right that we work to improve its operation in the future, as Alexander Stewart has highlighted. Um, I met with officials last week to discuss some of the points actually that he has raised today. So sp specifically on public awareness, the fund is going to increase the level of communication around activations on, first of all, the crisis identified, secondly, the short and medium term needs of the crisis, and thirdly, the response that the government is taking. Secondly, on responsible citizenship, the fund <coughs> will use these communications to show that Scotland is taking a leading role in thinking differently about humanitarian emergencies. Thirdly, on transparency and accountability, the Scottish Government will hold public-facing events with support from the HEF panel to show the work of the fund, but importantly, to critically discuss our humanitarian response openly. In summary, the increased focus on communications will help with enhanced transparency for the public in terms of what is being spent and where. That also brings with it increased opportunities to explain more clearly to the public what the fund is trying to achieve. Question number six, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on future arrangements for the Erasmus Plus programme for Scottish and European students. Michael Russell. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government has been consistent in arguing that Scotland should continue to uh, participate in Erasmus Plus for its substantial educational, cultural and economic benefits. Uh, this is part, of course, of the wider discussions on Brexit. And with your briefly indulgent, indulgent um, Presiding officer, I'd just like to say a word or two more widely about those negotiations. I have written to Michael Gove today, and I've copied a letter to the leaders of the parties uh, asking Mr. Gove that the uh, negotiations be suspended for six months, uh, given the unprecedented situation which we are now in. I pointed out to Mr. Gove that the Scottish Government has paused work on preparing for an independence referendum this year, something my officials have confirmed with the Electoral Commission today in a letter about testing. I think, uh, given that we have to focus all available resources 
on current and future demands and what is an unprecedented set of circumstances. It follows that from that that the preparations for a referendum this year will not take place. We would now strongly urge the UK government that the time has come for an equivalent action with regard to the Brexit process. Uh, we'd ask them to institute a pause to EU and UK negotiations for a period of at least six months. It would be impossible, in our view, for businesses and others to cope with the enormous challenge of coronavirus whilst at the same time preparing for a completely new relationship with the EU. And the pause is also necessary given the inevitable lack of parliamentary and public scrutiny of the negotiations and their progress over that period, when all attention and effort will be focused on our collective actions to tackle and defeat the coronavirus. It will also be difficult for the JMCEN to meet during that time. There'll be no opportunity for the UK's four governments to provide oversight of the negotiation as set out in its terms of reference. We work closely together on the unprecedented legislation we'll discuss tomorrow on coronavirus. I think it is essential that we both take realistic positions at this time. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? In the absence of any commitment by the UK Government beyond the current arrangements, can he give a commitment that Erasmus will continue in Scotland and will maintain that wonderful experience for both our students and our European friends? Michael Russell. We are very strongly committed to Erasmus as we're committed to other programmes. Uh, we made it clear to the UK Government, as have the other devolved administrations, that we wish Erasmus Plus to continue. And indeed, the, the UK Government has indicated to us that they are listening to that. The proof of that will be whether it does continue. But if it were not to continue, we would wish to be able to be part of Erasmus uh, in our own right. Uh, this is a matter for further negotiation. As I've said, I think that negotiating process has to pause at this stage and I hope that that is being listened to very intently. Uh, and that means that a decision on this will be some time away. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Yeah, I want to welcome the statement by the Minister about the, the referendum, and I think it would be sensible for the UK government to follow suit with Brexit. <laughs> so I'd like to echo his calls on that front as well. I think it is important that we recognise that this crisis needs our full attention, and we need to address these and work together in order to achieve that. So I welcome the Minister's statement. Michael Russell. Uh, I thank uh, Willie Rennie for that remark. I mean, quite clearly, we disagree on, on when this should uh, take place and how it should take place. But the imperative of the moment is absolutely clear at the present time. Uh, we have to defeat uh, the tremendous challenge that we face. We can only do that across this chamber and, uh, and across the, the four nations of these islands. And we will endeavour to do so. Question number seven, John Mason. Hey, thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the comments in its China engagement strategy regarding respect for human rights, what its position is on the recent full judgment of the China Tribunal on forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience? Michael Russell. Presenting officer, the conclusions drawn by the Tribunal are deeply concerning. We will continue to actively monitor the human rights situation in China. We endeavour to ensure that the Scottish Government does not engage with any organisations which, which participate in illegal activity or human rights abuse. Scottish ministers raise human rights issues with China regularly. John Mason. It appears from the report that organs from Falun Gong detainees and uh, possibly others it have been available on demand, uh, for example, at two weeks' notice, which is virtually impossible from a medical point of view. And can he further assure me that no Scottish universities or hospitals could possibly unwittingly be involved in, in helping this in any way? Michael Russell. Uh, quite clearly, we would uh, work very hard to ensure that no Scottish universities, hospitals or any other institutions are unwittingly uh, involved in any such barbaric practices, and we will continue to do so. That concludes questions on Constitution Europe and External Affairs, and we'll move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of SPCB Motion 21271 on reimbursement of members' expenses scheme. And I would ask Andy Whiteman, on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, to speak to and move the motion. Mr. Thank White. you, Presiding Officer. This motion has been lodged uh, on behalf of SPCB. We announced last week that in order to provide members with as much flexibility as possible in light of the impact of coronavirus, that we would make changes to the arrangements for employing temporary staff cover. Uh, this amendment to the reimbursement of members' expenses scheme allows the SPCB to do that, and I move the motion. 
This question will be put at decision time. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion number number open bracket close bracket with nothing in between <laughs> number 21305 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out revisions to tomorrow's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Uh, moved, presiding officer. Thank you. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, a question is that motion 21305 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 21297 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 21297 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of 10 Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 21287 to 21295 on approval of an SSI and 21296 on designation of a lead committee. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, let me move motions 21271, 21287, sorry, 21. 287, 21288, 21289, 21290, 21291, 21292, 21293, 21294, and 21295. <laughs> and 21296. Thank you very much. That was about approval of SSIs and on the designation of a lead committee. And the question on these motions will be put at decision time. Uh, to which we will shortly come. I'm afraid I'm going to have to suspend for about 45 seconds. Thank you. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 21271 in the name of Andy Whiteman on reimbursement of members' expenses scheme be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. I propose to ask a single question on 10 parliamentary bureau motions. If any member objects, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 21287 to 21296 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed. That concludes decision time. This meeting is closed. <laughs>